All right, so I kind of want to go over something that I don't think really fits in with the um, general topics that we've been discussing so far, but it's an important skill, and that is the ability to read scientific literature, okay? Um, you may be interested in something for your particular area of research, and it's good to start to become accustomed with reading the scientific literature um, at an early age, you know, when you're, in, when you're an undergrad, because when you get to graduate school, it's going to be expected that you're pretty proficient at reading these papers. You know, people are going to want to know that you can read these papers and decipher them and uh, pick out the, rel the essentially what you want to be able to do is pick out the relative information. Pick out what information corresponds to your area of expertise, what area corresponds to your area of research, and what can help you in your area of research. Or what can lead to the, a different idea, or can you discover a new experiment to maybe carry out based on this paper. Um, you know, so there's a lot to this, okay? And, and, there, and there, there's good reasons to do it. And I know, you know, most people don't have time, but you'll probably be assigned in your upper, upper um, level classes, 3,000, 4,000 level classes, um, to read some of these papers and maybe even report on them. So it's a good thing to get involved in early. So I have this paper here. It just came out the other day. It's called, um, it has this title here, this complicated title. Um, on folded proteins are IRU1 activating ligands that directly induce the on folded protein response. So the first place you want to start when reading the paper is to read the title and try to understand a little bit about what the title is saying. So they're basically saying that these on folded proteins or misfolded proteins as I'd rather call them, you know, are actually activating this IRU1, um, are actually activating this IRU1 um, proteins, okay? And so this is sort of like, it, the paper has an interesting um, spin, there's two, there's two competing hypotheses, and this paper seems to definitively say that one of these hypotheses is correct, but the other is not. So once you kind of get a feel for what this is saying here, you know, so they directly, um, that directly induce the unfolded protein response, you can move on to the abstract here, okay? And that's generally the part that most people will go right to. Okay, uh, any any um, scientist probably will say, let me go to the abstract and see if this paper is relevant because it, it takes a lot of work to read one of these papers. I mean, it's not like reading a novel. It's not easy reading. It's um, it takes thinking and time and practice to get good at. So you know, you're not going to want to waste your time reading a paper that's irrelevant to your you know, to your studies. Um, but anyway, you can find from the abstract generally a brief introduction to what the paper is about, and not only a brief introduction to what the paper is about, but generally a lot of times they will, they will also present the results. Okay, at least you know briefly state the results. Say we did this, we found this. Okay, um, and they'll kind of try and sum up the whole experiment in this little paragraph here. Okay, and that's a good indicator. And like I said, that's a that, that's one of the first places you want to start. You want to read the um, abstract and kind of get a feel for the paper and determine if it's something you'd like to read. From there, I'd say the main skill in discussing these papers is to be able to interpret all of these diagrams. Okay, all of these charts and labels, and because this is the stuff. These are the experiments. Okay, that's the data from the experiments. And, you know, in the paper they tell you the conclusions they drew from these things, but you as a scientist are going to want to critique it, maybe. You're going to maybe want to think about, um, you know, does that make sense? You know, do, do their conclusions um, correspond to what I'm getting out of reading this? Or when I analyze this chart, do I see the same kind of thing? Do Are there ways that it could be improved? Are there things that they missed? Okay. So... You want to be able to look at these things and you want to be able to understand them. And generally, that information is contained within the body of the paper here. But a lot of times, you can find a great deal out about these charts just by reading these little inserts here, which say figure one. Okay, and then they say an unfolded protein co-immunoprecipitates co with IRE1. Okay, so this figure one is talking about some... Um, amino precipitates, okay, and IRE1, and then it tells you specifically, okay, chart A, so here's here's A, or figure A, figure 1A, so figure 1A, figure 1B, okay, so it tells you exactly what they are, and, and they provide a little bit of information, okay, it's probably not going to be enough for a beginner to understand what's going on, 
but it will certainly be a starting point. It's the first point that it's the first part that I would read before looking in the body for for more information. And a lot of times from this information, like I said, you, you'll you'll be able to decipher exactly what's going on here. Then other times you won't, so you'll have to go to the body. Um, another important skill is really to be able to identify just like what the main point of the paper is, the hypotheses. What is, what are what is the hypothesis? You know, what are they trying to 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 say? Okay, what are they trying to find out? And that can usually be found at the beginning of the introduction, at the uh, beginning rather, the end of the introduction. Um, you can see in this paper they really don't have it laid out in a way where they're like saying this is the introduction, but essentially this beginning part here is the introduction. And at the end of this first page here, where they start presenting some results, if you actually read in the body here, they're not really talking about the results from these figures yet. Okay, that's going to come later on. So from these figures you can see over here and over here, that's not really presented in all of this here. What is essentially presented is the, the two different hypotheses. And, you know, one of them is a direct binding model, okay, where these misfolded proteins bind to IRE1. The IRE1 forms oligomers, okay, uh, goes through a process of oligomerization. And, you know, that, that results in more binding, okay, and, and, a, and a stress response or a UPR um, response. And there's an alternative mo model here, which they talk about. And that might be important things that you need to um, know. But basically at the bottom here is where they kind of really talk about it. And they start talking about what's going on here. They, they say that to test the hypothesis that unfolded proteins are IRE1 activating ligands. So the activating ligands are the unfolded proteins. We determine whether um, IRE1 interacts with a constitutively misfolded mutant of carboxypeptidase Y, okay, so CPY, that's basically what they call it, CPY, and they test it with the wild type, WT means wild type, CPY, and mutant, which is CPY star, has an asterisk next to it, um, and this is retained in the endoplasmic reticulum, expression of CPY induced the UPR, okay, so that's the, unfold, the unfolded protein response signal, in the IRE dependent ma in an IRE dependent manner, whereas expression of the wild type CPY induced the UPR to a lesser extent. Okay, and that can be seen again in Figure One. So one of the things I do is I go around and I highlight these things. I highlight, you know, Figure One. If this is coming from Figure One, then I want to know that this is the information that corresponds to Figure One. So I will, I will certainly look at those things. And basically, I mean, I know I said this is kind of the basic hypotheses, but but, the, but this is the basic hypotheses. I mean, and this paper is laid out a little bit different than, than literature I've read previously. Um, but the, the principle remains the same. So they lay out this hypothesis, and then they back it up with this data in figure one. Okay, these two pieces of data, this figure 1A and figure 1B. And in that, they go ahead and talk about, you know, what that data means and, what, and the conclusions that they drew from that data. And you can kind of move through the paper in that fashion, okay? Because they go from one thing to the next. Because as scientists, they say, okay, well, if we decide that, you know, IRE1 or the UPR response is, um, is activated in an IRE1-dependent manner, then, you know, the next question is, you, you want to say, well, then does IRE1 bind directly to CPY, um, you know, the mutant form of CPY? So that's the next question they ask, and you can see it just kind of it just kind of goes in a linear fashion here, okay? Um, and then they'll start talking about you know the process that they went through to show that CPY you know has these binding sites and that these binding sites might preferentially bind in the manner they're expressing, and they do that and they go through this process here. But once again, what you can see here from this um, from this data here is that you have all these charts, of course, okay, and then you move down here, and you can see these figures, okay, this information, again, associated with the figures, it tells you what's going on here, um, and that will give you a good idea of what all this is about without even reading the body of the paper. So this is one approach to doing this. And, and basically it just continues on in a um, you know, in a linear fashion. You'll be able to move on to the next thing and look at that chart and the information about the charts is here, um, along with in, in the paper the, um, the details about what these things mean and the conclusions that were drawn from them.
Now, a final bit of detail that I, that I will say after after you've gone through all the charts. I mean, basically, the way I I work on these papers is that I will figure out the hypotheses, read the abstract, then I'll I then I'll identify what each of these charts means. So each you know each graph, each chart, whatever is in each figure. I'll go through each figure individually and, and work out what each thing means and exactly what they can on and the conclusions that were drawn and, and then kind of like the in the back that really kind of sum everything up. This last paragraph here that or two, these last couple of paragraphs here that I have in this paper. They, they really just, like, if you didn't understand the experiment or you're having trouble just understanding what's going on, it's a good place to look at the end. You know, at the end where they kind of sum everything up and restate the results that they received, of course, and why they think things they think. Um, it can be really, really helpful to just consult that. And you can consult that at any time. I mean, essentially, the way reading these papers goes is, you, you know, you read these papers any way you want. You don't have to read them in a linear fashion. You can skip around, move around, read different parts, skip over parts. Um, you know, it really depends on your purpose and your use of the paper. But, you know, just I just want to kind of point out that that's kind of how I would go about doing it. So if I were doing like a like a step-by-step -step approach, I would start by reading the title and the abstract. From the title and abstract, I would move on to reading the um, each individual figure. So I would start with figure one. I would read the little bit on figure one that's next to it. But then I would also probably go into the literature and read about figure one and about what the the, the scientists did to um, to figure it out. Okay, so that would be my that would be my next step, and I would do that for each individual figure. So figure one A, figure one B, figure two A, figure two B, however many there are. I would do that for each individual one, and I would want to know what's going on in each individual one. Once I understand what's going on in each individual um, chart and graph and whatever else is presented in the data, I I'll move on to um, I'll move on to reading the you know summary in the end, the, the conclusion. Okay, essentially I'll read the conclusion and I'll see if it makes sense to me, you know, and if these things correspond and to to what I to what I think they should be and to what other people think they should be. And you should read these things with a critical with a critical eye essentially. You, you know, you shouldn't be taking everything as pure fact. I mean, yes, these scientists did a very nice job and put together a really great paper, especially the one I have in my hands here. But the, po the point being is that it's not always perfect. It can be improved upon. And they're not always right. Um, these things are proven wrong and alternate tests are done and alternate studies are done that prove the opposite. Okay, this happens all the time. So, you know, don't be afraid to be critical of it too. You know, I mean, you'll know a good paper if you read one. You'll know a bad paper if you read one with some experience. So after I read the conclusions, I'll look in the back here. If I'm thinking about using this paper for some kind of research, then I would want to read in the back here and see if there's any sort of experiment I might want to carry out. So maybe there's some kind of research I can do in the future. A lot of times the authors pose questions. They pose questions to the reader to say, well, we're not sure about this. It requires more investigation. So that might be a clue to you to say, okay, well, maybe I'd like to investigate that, especially if the paper you're reading is in your area of expertise.